Hey everyone, welcome back to our series, Control Freak. We hope that this has sort of helped you understand and be able to navigate the craziness of what's going on. And tonight, we're gonna talk about change. You see, none of us like change and we're not really wired to deal with it properly. And a lot of times there's a certain verse that we love to use when we're going through suffering and hardship and change. And that's Jeremiah 29, 11. Now I probably don't even have to read it yet for you to know that verse because so many of us use it for all sorts of different circumstances and take it out of its original context. The context of Jeremiah 29, 11 is that it was written to the Israelites as they are going into Babylonian exile. They are being taken out of their homeland and being taken to Babylon for 70 years and they need some hope and some encouragement that they're going to be able to get through it. Now, a lot of times we use this verse in two ways. We either use it individually, saying that this is our verse. We make Jeremiah 29, 11 about us as individuals, saying that God knows the plans we have for us specifically and that everything's gonna be okay and everything's gonna be all right and everything's gonna move on real quickly and we're just gonna be fine. The other way that we try to use it is as a nation, that we try to make the nation of Israel be the nation of the United States, that we make it look like it's all about our country. But here's the thing. The United States is not God's chosen people amongst all others. You see, Israel was going to be the nation that Jesus came through. The United States is not producing any Jesuses right now, and it never will. The United States is not God's answer for the world. Christ is. And Jesus was going to come through the Israelites, that God has this covenant promise with his people that salvation is going to come through them. And so it makes much more sense that he would be trying to give hope and a plan for this people, for this group, much more than trying to make this verse about the United States. And this is what he has to say to them to try to give them hope. Verse 10 of Jeremiah 29 says, This is what the Lord says, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. So they've just been told that they're gonna be in exile for 70 years and that this change is not gonna end anytime soon. In fact, as a people, most of them will die before they're able to go back home again. But let's look at another situation where the Israelites did not respond well to change. And that was in Exodus. They've just been brought out of slavery from Egypt and they already don't like the way things are going and the challenges that they're having to endure. And the Israelites respond in a way that most of us respond with change as well. You see, we are not wired to like change. In fact, we interpret change as a threat. I had a conversation with a therapist friend of mine and I asked him why is it that there are so many elderly couples that whenever one of them passes away after being married for 50, 60 years, that the other one follows them shortly after. What is it about that relationship that causes that to happen? And he said this, that uh, the psychological world and profession has uncovered that people do not like change. And in fact, they get very used to routine and habit and they love that. And that they crave normalcy, crave a routine of something that they always know is gonna be around. And the longer you have a routine, the longer that you have a system and a relationship that is constant in your life, the more it hurts to lose that. To the point that if you are in a particular pattern in your life for a long time, that your body would sooner give up than continue to move forward and have to adapt to change. And so it is completely natural for all of us, not good, but natural, that we do not like change and that we look at it as pain, as a threat, something to be avoided and moved past rather than embraced and moved through. And that's the problem, that we are all trying to move through pain and through change, but instead of doing that and walking that path, we get off of that path, that path of acceptance into different areas that we shouldn't be going. So imagine that you're on a road and that you can go to the left or to the right side of that road and it's not necessarily healthy to do so. You need to stay on the road, you need to be moving forward and going from where you are and moving through that change and letting that be something that changes you and that you adapt to it and that you roll with the punches. So let's talk about the left side of that road and that is the road of quitting. The Israelites, they said it's better if we just were in Egypt still, that it would be better if we never left. They hated the idea that all this change was occurring, that they weren't going to be in control anymore. And so that's what we sometimes do as well. We just catastrophize everything, that everything is just the end of the world, and so there's no point in trying anymore. 
we give up, we resign ourselves, and we have no energy to try to do any better. Now let's look at the right side of the road, and that is the road of panic where we try to take back control as much as we can. And the way that the Israelites tried to do that is that because they didn't know the way that God was going to orchestrate things, that they decided to craft for themselves their own God that they could control. That they made a golden calf and chose to worship that as if that was going to work. Now, we might not do that, but we will try to make a lot of steps and do a lot of things to take back control. For some of us today, that's trying to hoard a bunch of things because we feel safer in our castle made of toilet paper rolls. Whatever it is, we try to take back control. We hoard, we plan, we look at all of the news articles just to feel a little sense of control because we've got information. But in our attitudes, the way we treat people, sometimes we will act out in a way that makes us feel like we're in control as well. You see, whenever you take that right road of panic, then what happens is you get a short fuse with the people around you. Some of you may already be experiencing that at home. Uh, parents, you might have a shorter fuse with your kids. Students, you might be having that same sort of experience that for some reason with all of this chaos going on, you don't know how to be in control of your emotions all the time, and so you lash out real quickly over small things. That's what happens whenever we decide that we're gonna take that road of panic instead of walking in a straight road of doing the next right thing. But there's a third thing that we try to do. Rather than go to the right or to the left, we try to leave. We try to escape. And we medicate ourselves with things that'll make us feel numb and to not feel like we're in this situation anymore. On the extreme, it could be turning to drugs or alcohol or unhealthy relationships. But for some of us, it looks more like binging where you're just trying to take your mind off of your situation and feel numb for a little bit because this hurts and you don't wanna do anything. That you just want to escape the feelings that you're going through right now. And anything that you can use as a distraction or as a medication to leave this problem, to not remember that you're going through a hard time of change, you will use anything that you can to distract yourself from the moment. So rather than taking that leftward road of quitting, that right road of panic, or just trying to escape the situation altogether, we need to ask ourselves, how do we stay on the road, continue to move forward, continue to do the next right thing, and let change change us, rather than letting change break us. Getting back to Jeremiah 29, 11, the way that we often use that verse is to make it seem like if we turn back to God, then he's gonna stop this process. That he's just gonna expedite the change process and that everything's gonna be fine. But that was not the case for the Israelites. He said that it was still going to take 70 years, no matter what they did, no matter what was gonna happen as punishment for their faithlessness, they still have to endure this for 70 years. And that's a lie that a lot of us are told in our culture today, that if you are doing well, that if you are loving Jesus, that if you are uh, turning to him and you're trying to serve him as best as you can, that he will either let your life be easy and be comfortable, or that if discomfort shows up, that he'll cause it to go by real quickly and you'll be prosperous and have much more on the other side of it. But Jeremiah does not teach that at all. He does not teach that you're going to avoid suffering and not have any difficulties in life. Things that are filling up the pews on Sunday mornings are churches that are preaching that God wants you to be prosperous and rich and wealthy and healthy all the time and that he won't allow you to go through any changes that would disrupt your life like that. And here's my uh, concern for this time. And that's, since all of this has happened and hit all of us, that the people who were going to church and pursuing God just for those benefits that churches were saying that they would have, will no longer go to church and no longer seek after God because they realize that that was a lie and that difficulty can come to all of us at any time. But what I hope is this, that, that our reaction won't be that we give up on Christianity because this is something that was a falsehood because this is something we were deceived in, but rather we would pursue truth, that we would pursue wisdom, and we would pursue teaching that says this, that you will still suffer, that you will still endure hardship and difficulty, but God is going to allow those changes to change you, to uh, work in you, to make you better and more like him, and that also that there's something on the other side of it that if we try to run around it and that if we try to move past these changes instead of being in the moment, being in the reality of our situation and experiencing them, that we can still see God do an amazing thing and use our story despite the craziness of our circumstance. So how do we stay on that road? How do we avoid quitting? How do we avoid panicking? How do we avoid trying to escape the situation? What do we do to stay on that road and move forward and here's a couple of things that we can do. 
Firstly, we can surround ourselves with people who are like our Jeremiah's, who are going to tell us the truth and also tell us hope. That just because we're being told that it's gonna be our 70 years of difficulty does not mean that we still can't cling to the fact that God's going to do something on the other side of it. Doesn't mean that God's not going to still come through and see us through suffering. So we need to surround ourselves with people who will say the hard thing, but then also say the beautiful promise. And another thing that we can do in this is to try to embrace the reality of our situation. We need to embrace what we've lost. The Israelites had to embrace the fact that they're going to be in exile for 70 years. They're going to have to embrace the fact that this difficulty is going to last a while. And so rather than trying to say, you know what, this will be fine. Once the weather gets warmer, then COVID-19 is going to disappear. And all of us are going to have better jobs than we did before. Rather than trying to do those things and trying to escape the reality, we need to just embrace the reality that we have, accept the things that we have potentially lost, and then root ourselves in what's the next right thing to do. What is the next right thing that you can do spiritually in your relationship with God and getting closer to Him? What is the next right thing to do and the next right way to react? If you are on that road of quitting, for example, the first thing you need to do is get back into community, back into engaging with the people around you, and back into accepting the fact that this is not the end of all things. If you're on the road of panic, you need to embrace the fact that you do not have power that you are powerless in this situation and be okay with that fact and sort of let go of the fact that you can't hoard enough stuff to have complete control in your life. And if you're on the road of escape, that you need to re-enter the situation, that you need to have people that you're willing to look at and say, hey, these are some addictions that I've been turning to to try to self-medicate, to try to numb myself to the situation and help them have, you, have them help you pulled out of those things and back onto the road of reality. Surround yourself with people who will remind you of reality, who will remind you of God's promises, and who will encourage you to the next right thing and move forward through this. I believe that God can use this change in all of our lives to be better for it. A lot of us have lived a sheltered life and do not know tragedy and hardship. And because of that, we would rather give up, rather try to take control or escape when change occurs. But let's let this change us. Let's let this mold us and let God mold us closer to the image of Jesus Christ, where we can take a punch, where we can keep rolling, and that we are wiser, more mature, and more godly for this process.